right. Well, it is noon, so it is time for What's New This Week at One Schoolhouse. I'm Sarah Hanawal, the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse. And today I have an exciting guest, and it's also just a super appropriate time to have her here. So Erica Nielsen Andrew from Folio Collaborative is here. And Erica, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. So I'm just going to do kind of our opening. We're still getting folks in from the waiting room. So I'm going to share some things so that nobody misses your introduction. So as I said, we're here today to talk about building a culture of collaboration. We're going to talk a little bit about why this is such a good match for what's going on in most schools today and what's on the minds of academic leaders. So on our blog today, we have what makes teacher onboarding stick, and that is advice from Kareen Dadini. One schoolhouse has very high teacher retention, but we have been growing over the last number of years. And so every year we need to think and rethink about uh, teacher onboarding and what the best practices are. So Kareen has a lot to share there. Next week, Peter Gao will be joining me with advice for academic leaders about welcoming new faculty. We have lots of registrations in our student course programming. So if you are considering that, please can um, reach out to Liz Cates, my colleague, and find out what you need to, um, sorry, I saw the chat. Sienna, thank you for putting the link in the chat there. So reach out if you are interested in courses. Some of them are getting close to full already. And then, as you know, every week we do a poll. We do a poll survey. And this week the question was, what are your top two priorities for new faculty? And Erica, I told you, I think at the beginning, I almost wanted to just spring this on you because number one, by a lot actually, collaborating and connections with colleagues. So we're gonna talk a little bit about all of these this month as we go through this, but. Erica, I'm going to stop sharing and ask you to introduce yourself to everyone, and we're going to get started on our own collaboration. Excellent. Welcome, everyone, and so good to see you, Sarah. I'm delighted to have this conversation with you today. And as I said, my name is Erica, and I'm the Director of Professional Learning at Folio Collaborative. I'm based in San Francisco and one of those educators that's been around a long time whose passion is really thinking about creating the cultures for teacher growth, connectedness, and belonging. Well, thank you so much. And one of the things that y'all have released re recently is a special report. Can you talk a little bit about this report, how it came to be? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we think a lot about at Folio Collaborative is how teacher growth through collaboration is a strategic priority. And one of the things that's kind of curious is when we talk to educators, they say, like these really clear visions of what they want for their school community, things like experimentation, conversation, like collaborative problem solving around problems of practice, and yet they don't live in those cultures. And so we were thinking about like, okay, so if that's what we really want, yet there's this gap, what can we learn about why that is so? And so we created this study with E.E. E. Ford and McDonough and a bunch of educators across the country. And basically we were on this listening tour to organizations that are highly effective at being collaborative. Organizations that are for-profit, nonprofit, and schools who are known for being really successful at that. And also conducting these empathy interviews to figure out like what makes it possible to have a collaborative environment that educators dream up. Wow. So how did you find the organizations that were highly collaborative? Were they ones that you already knew about or how did that go? Well, kind of word of mouth. Like um, some of them are ones that we all know about and others may be a little bit of a secret. But yeah, we, as I say, we went to 12 of those that are known. Great. Known for being really successful to be learned from. Yeah. And so what were some of the key findings? Right. So... We relearned our hypothesis going into it, which of course sometimes happen. And by that, I mean, a major key finding was that um, growth, professional learning, 
feedback and collaboration or inextricably, ah, hello, I'll get that word, <laughs> inextricably linked. They go, like you can't have one without the other. And so we saw those four features in all of the organizations that we observed. And then kind of related is how like teacher growth exists in collaborative environments, but it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg like teacher growth creates a collaborative environment and collaborative environment also fuels teacher growth. So we relearned those two things. But we also learned another thing. Um, we learned another thing, which is even though teachers often have in their graduate profile wanting kids to learn how to collaborate, mm -hmm. we spend our days as teachers with kids, not with adults. And so even though we want it and we teach kids how to collaborate, we don't necessarily know how to do it ourselves. And so that really led us to being able to create this framework to help us understand how to go about it. I think that is so interesting when, you know, when we as an organization really value something and we talk about it and, and yeah. we don't have it embedded throughout, there are certain areas that we can point to and be really excited about and there are other areas where it's just not there yet. Exactly. But yeah, and I just want to let everybody know, Sienna has dropped a link to the full report that you can download from the Folio website here in the chat. Okay. I also want to let everyone know that you are welcoming questions. So if you've got a question, please put it in the Q&A and we'll make sure to leave some time for that as we go forward. Great. Yeah, so, so what surprised you? <laughs> yeah, there were a couple of surprises, even though we sort of reproved our hypothesis. And one surprise was that the design team who was doing all of the observing and the creation of this framework learned a lot about collaboration themselves. So in other words, they had this design task of how do we create this in our schools and the process of doing that together gave them collaborative experiences they hadn't had before. And so it was one of those things where I was just saying that the adults don't necessarily, we don't know how to do this, we don't spend our day doing it, but having this experience together taught them volumes about what it could mean for the organizations and schools that they live in. So that was a surprise that they would learn so much. Um, and then the other thing that we learned is that there, although collaboration is a really big concept, you can actually make a lot of progress chipping away at it with small little moves. And that's really what this framework is all about is small little moves you can make to unlock your environment to make it more collaborative. Nice. Those yeah. sound like good surprises. Yeah, they were really good surprises. Yeah, really good surprises. Uh, I think it's particularly interesting that when you um, set out to study something, you end up emulating what it is that you're studying while you're studying. I mean, there's something very metacognitive about that experience, I would imagine. Yeah, and I think really powerful and kind of speaks to the, to the comment about, like, if we need to learn how to do it, then let's get into experiences where we have to collaborate and practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So one of the things that you and I talked about when we were getting ready for this webinar is how last year educators needed to collaborate and it was harder. So what did y'all hear and learn about educators collaborating in this past year? Yeah, you know, one of the, th you know, one would think that it might be a year of high collaboration because there was so much to figure out. But I think because of the pace and volatility of what schools were facing, we actually heard about a lot of decrease in collaboration. It was a little more of a, just go do this, just go figure it out. And unfortunately, quite isolating for a lot of teachers and trying to figure out something really big and different alone. So, you know, given this time of year right now and academic leaders are thinking about onboarding new teachers, and it seems like this fall is a good time to make a shift to a more intentional culture of collaboration because you mentioned challenges of last year. And so coming back together, we hope in space. And then I noticed in your framework, making collaboration a key element in hiring, onboarding and professional learning. So this seems like this is the time you've got teachers who joined you last year who maybe didn't have the onboarding experience you would have wanted them to have. You've got teachers who maybe felt more isolated than they typically do. And now you've got new teachers. So can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about being intentional in this? 
Yeah, I think it's one of those key opportunity moments again, a different opportunity than last year, but many schools are also sort of drafting off this year of, and a half of needing to be more agile. And in that way, it really lays the groundwork for continuing with that energy and really dialing up the collaboration because now we can build from these lessons and do it in a way that really helps our new teachers land and feel a sense of belonging and collective understanding of where we are headed. So there's some specific things that our framework talks about and like just getting really concrete for a moment. So particularly around hiring, you know, we incentivize um, solo work. We do not incentivize collaborate, collaborative work. So how do you set the tone in hiring by not just providing teaching tasks for candidates to do, but collaborative tasks? And in that way, you're getting a sense of who they would be as a collaborative colleague, but you're also setting a tone. Okay. Um, yeah, right? Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah. But then with onboarding, this could be a little bit of a push depending upon the state of your collaborative activity, because one of the things we learned from the report is how we may have dreams and a somewhat clear vision of what we hope a collaborative environment feels like to work in, but it's not yet concrete enough to be actionable. And so we really, really need to spell out what collaboration means to us. And so this could be a task that if it's not yet specified, could be accomplished before a lot of the onboarding happens so that new faculty understand the environment that they're in. I mean, often we have collaborative norms, but they're not concretized, which makes it really hard for new staff to belong and feel included. And I think, you know, many educators are facing a lot of new teachers. And so it's really, I know they feel the pressure and the excitement of wanting them to feel included and in belonging quickly. So really letting them in on the norms of collaborative activity and what it looks like at the school would be really helpful. That is such a powerful um, recognition, I think. What are the things mm -hmm. that your faculty do really well together but nobody's ever written down? Right. And so it's not, you know, it's not necessarily inviting to the new person who feels confused or, or is still mm -hmm. trying to figure those things out. We hear that a lot in our courses for new to girls, new to boys, new to indie schools. You know, we've got those, I call them the trifecta of new, new teacher courses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and there's one other thing. Can I sneak in one other idea? Uh -huh. Okay, course. this is actually around professional learning. So this would include, include the full faculty and one of the things that um, you and I talked about that I think is really true is that last year, teachers probably never worked harder for so little results. Like not many people walked away thinking that they had a great year. And what's problematic about that is that really chips away at a teacher's sense of efficacy about how effective they are. And we know from John Hattie's work that even more important than a teacher's individual efficacy is a sense of collective efficacy, that together we can really use, use best practices that impact kids in positive ways. And so that's a way to really like weave in collaboration through professional development to really ratchet up that sense of collective efficacy. So I think you just taught me a new phrase that I want to start using, collective efficacy. I really like that. Um, yeah. And you've mentioned a couple of times now making things concrete. Can you, can you talk us through a little bit about how someone could make things more concrete? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the, and I would say um, the framework has a deck of cards that folks can get. And then the deck of cards, it shows all these concrete behaviors. Um, what I would like to say too, is that there's some expression that talks about like to change a relationship that needs unlocking. It just takes one person to change because then that encourages someone else to have a different behavior. Collaboration is the same way, that it just takes small little things that can unlock a system that's incentivized to be siloed. And so for instance, it can be like the thing I was saying a minute ago about naming what we mean about collaboration. It can also be um, a head of school being really vulnerable and leading the way with what he or she is intending to learn this year, tiny little thing. It can be putting whiteboards up next to, in the faculty room next to boards with stickies to encourage people to collaborate together, tiny little thing. Um, it can be, um, 
having a feature in your faculty meeting that's around this week's failure and encouraging people to share failures and not just celebrations to sort of normalize learning together. But these are all tiny little moves that help shift the way people move together. So don't underestimate the power of a small change. No, not at all. Got some slides too about your framework. Is this the time where you want to? Yeah, let's look at them. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen again. And so tell us a little bit more about how this framework came into being to make these, these steps more concrete. Yeah, sure. So when we observed these 12 organizations and we're trying to figure out what gets in the way or how to how to create these conditions or small moves for collaboration, we came up with five. And the first one is one that I mentioned before, which is really about being clear about what we mean and what we're aspiring to. And then the middle two are really more about normalizing behaviors that collaborative cultures do. And it's really about living the collaborative culture in the ways that I was just articulating, as well as really democratizing learning and what we share. And then the last two, that, well, the fourth one is more structural, and this is really making sure that you have the time, that you even have spaces, like a lot of the organizations we observed have collaborative spaces and visually you feel different when you walk into them. So this is more of a structural one. And then the last one is really thinking about power dynamics and schools are typically pretty hierarchical, but where are there spaces where collaborative groups can make decisions and they have the room to do that. And it is well known and understood. So I really like this, and I think this is probably a good time. We've got a question in the Q&A, and I would just want to okay. remind everybody that questions are welcome. Um, and Deb asks, it seems that one of the most important commodities for collaboration is time, and time is hard to find. So did you find, she asked for recommendations, and did you see examples of ways that organizations really carved out the time needed for collaboration? Yes, we did see examples, and some were like things that, this school might already be doing, which is to have late start or early release to have this dedicated block of time for teachers. So that was one way. Um, the other way, and this is probably well known, but important to remember every year that what gets scheduled at the start of the year happens. And if it doesn't get scheduled at the start of the year, it likely won't happen because once the machine of the school year begins, it's really hard to make time. Um, the other thing was that people played with faculty meetings, which are a given commodity, and mm -hmm. just change the way those work to protect them for collaboration, whether that means moving everything to email or whatnot or memo, but protecting the spaces that you have and just simply using time different. And I think we often feel like we can't, but what we saw in these organizations is they just did. They just did it. So it's the Acknowledging that there are barriers or, or mm -hmm. problems with rethinking the time and then doing it anyway. Doing it anyway, yeah. Yeah. So we had, um, if several months ago now at this point, I think we had a couple of webinars that addressed the issue of professional time for faculty. Mm -hmm. And that when schools really commit to building that into the schedule so that it's not a you can do this, but you've got to have the class coverage and you've got to have the substitute and you've got to have all these other things. But when it's really intentionally made into the schedule for professional time, there were some great things that happened there. So I would encourage folks to think about that as well. Yeah, that's really sending the message that it matters. Yeah, and are you ready for your, should I move to the next slide? Yeah, move to the next slide. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <There we are. laughs> Okay, so this slide, the next couple of slides are just really breaking down those five building blocks. And so the, what you see on top is the top building block. And then what you see to the right of that are four different specific things that you could do to really establish clear expectations or a clear vision for what we mean by collaboration. And the one below that is really around normalizing collaborative behavior. And then you see some examples there. And what the report does is really go into more detail. And then what this deck of cards does is really give you examples of what you can do with your teams or faculty in each of these different behaviors. Great. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide and then I've got a couple of questions that I 
had when I was reading these. Um, okay. And so Alrighty. you talked through this one and then I'm gonna ask you my question. Okay. <laughs> so these are the, the remaining three building blocks and the, the top one being around how to really encourage the sharing of ideas. And then the structure one we were just talking about with the use of time and then the final one really democratizing power a little bit more so that collabor collaborative groups can make decisions or work on things together to, you know, again, to build collective efficacy. So there you go. Good, well, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions. One is, we've got leaders who have new teachers coming in. How can an academic leader set up a system so that the new teacher feels like they are a contributor and not supposed to just kind of be in the meeting and be there? Yeah, well, you know, similar to that slide you showed at the beginning about connection and collaboration being top on their mind for new teachers, I think it's top on everybody's mind that although the last year and a half have been incredibly difficult, I know folks sort of see the opportunity and also the pressure to have a really incredible year. And so incredible year really starts with the whole full faculty, particularly new teachers, feeling like they are part of shaping the path forward. And so I think one concrete thing to consider is how to build a group of influencers, like a group at the school that represents all different roles, whose explicit charge is really thinking about how do we take us where we are as a collaborative team, as a school, to the next step, given like you can think about it, what we face, or you can think it more positively with the opportunity that we have now. And so I think that like making sure that that team is in place and that they have a clear charge to really like, like to be responsible. It doesn't have to be all on the head's shoulder, but to have the charge, the opportunity to make sure that all faculty and staff are clear about who we are, where we're going, how we all fit in and to really set the tone for collaboration from the get-go and to have like this shared purpose of what they're trying to accomplish in a clear sense of what success looks like at the end of the year if we were to be more collaborative than we are now. Ooh, I like, you know, we're all about backwards design here at One Schoolhouse. I, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, what does it look like at the end of the year? Right. So I want to dive a little bit more into the term you use there of influencers. Yes. I want to ask you to talk about teachers and other people in the school who could have a real impact on the collaborative culture who may not be in a position that they think of as I'm in charge of this or I'm going to lead a collaboration. Yeah. So I wish I could think of the name of this. There's this great five minute video, um, a TED talk, and it talks about the power of going first. And Anyway, it's, I'm going to ruin the video. I should just give you the link later. But in any event, there, it, the point is, is that you don't have to have a formal role to have people follow you. And so the idea of influencers is that there are people in a culture who are moving things one way or another. And culture is one of those things that you either build a collaborative culture or, it's, or you don't. Like you either unlock it or it stays locked. And so influencers, all those people who typically go first, whether they have the title or not, really helpful if they don't, and other people follow. And it's, I think we typically know who those people are, but sometimes we know who the negative influencers are. We're looking for the people who will say, let's do this informally because yeah. they want to, not because they can or have to. And I think um, it's the first follower TED Talk. Is it, does that Yes, sound the first cute? follower. Yes, that's <laughs> okay. it. That's and it. I won't say so good. what's in it. So yeah, exactly. So good. So we'll get that out there if we can't find it before the end of the webinar and drop it in the chat. But yes, that is one yeah. worth um, we're sending out too, I think. Yeah. So, so when leaders are are thinking about identifying these folks and setting up some teams, in your research and in the framework, what makes a team gel, right? How do, they, how do they come together and become a collaborative force? Are there things that a leader can do to, to help ease that transition? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, absolutely. And I was just looking though, look at the chat for a second. There's some, yeah. 
Okay, I was looking at what they, they were talking about that made them thrive, because part of the answer to your question is right there. I think um, one thing that a leader can do is to be unequivocal that it matters and that they will do everything in their power to create collaboration, because again, they see it as linked to growth and growth is linked to collective efficacy, which is linked to teacher staying in the profession, which is really, really important for our new teachers. And so one is like being sure that this is gonna happen. The other thing is going about and defining together what we think it means. The third is what we've talked about protecting time. But the fourth is making sure that once there is time to be collaborative, that we know how to be collaborative together. Like we know of all those meetings that once we have them, that don't particularly feel like, like those meetings are taken up by adult complaint and not around collaborating together around best practices to make things better for students. And so it's really taking the time to make sure that once we have that time and the vision and the energy to do it, that we know how to move well together in those meetings. Because there's nothing that kills a meeting more or the collaborative spirit more than not being able to move together well. And that just takes time to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about uh, what some just amazing elementary school teachers who I have known in yeah. my career who have had, if you're sitting in the blue chair, you have this assignment. Oh, right. Right. Uh, and so I'm going to just apologize for a second. Something's so sorry. I'm sorry. I have something. I hear some knocking. <laughs> So when we think about those things, right, defining those roles and putting yes. things in exactly the way they should be, and then what's the response? Do people feel controlled or do they feel empowered? Talk about that a little bit. I think it depends. And I think this is where influencers can be really helpful. Like as a school leader, I would never do anything without teachers who wanted to do it and go first and do it, um, because otherwise it just is received as top down as opposed to let's do this together. Um, so I think it's really important that these influence are, are in the room. And honestly, even though like, we live in institutions of learning, sometimes as adults, we forget to have fun together. And a lot of the activities that came from this framework are really ones that help you have a little fun together, build deeper relationship, and then go at, dig in. And, but really pause to have joy and know each other better and break what we understand about each other. So I think that's great. So what advice do you want to give? We're about to run out of time. So I, I know, I just saw that. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so what advice do you have someone? Well, first of all, I'm going to say go to Folio Collaborative and get the whole report, right? So yes. download that. And then what advice do you have some for someone to think about from now? You know, they're in that sort of intense onboarding. So maybe there's some things that you can lay groundwork in, but then where do they really want to go in the fall? Yeah, you know, um, I would say rest up and dial up your fun because your number one job is to help people feel seen and feel like they belong. And everything I've talked about that surrounds that is really how do you make time for that structure that create activities that build that but it's really all about feeling like you are the every faculty member feeling like yeah, I'm the only one in the room I mean meaning I am seen we are all seen and I think number two is knowing what you want to accomplish together like <laughs> you have a visitor <laughs> sorry about that that was the thumping all right. was <laughs> and then there were three <laughs> but yeah being really clear about what you're trying to accomplish together because once you have that, then the door opens to collaboration. There's a deep purpose. So I feel like we just did a little demo of don't take yourself too seriously. Yes, and have a little bit of fun. Make sure that you can laugh and um, get ready for that. So yeah, indeed. <laughs> thank you so much. And Erica, I just want to mention too, y'all are going to have a course in this. Yes. So we can are. you want to share just a little bit about how you're going to, you know, put that together in the fall for folks who are interested? Yes, then I hope people will come join us because we are essentially digging in deep to each of those five building blocks and, and hearing from other 
leaders, like how they go about bringing collaboration alive. And so it'll be both very concrete as well as um, giving us pictures of what it could look like. Right, so essentially it's an opportunity to collaborate with other academic leaders on how you might collaborate better back at school. And I think that's a conversation that it, you know is really invigorating and inspiring. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.